All right, we'll, uh, we'll at least introduce ourselves in, in, in this session. So uh, my name is Adam Shepard. I am a complete Drupal noob. Uh, for those of you guys who are wondering who the heck is this person, uh, presenting next to, to Stefan Kolesket, I'm sure you guys all know. Uh, so this session is about linked data in Drupal. And so if you know a lot about linked data and are already using it with Drupal, this might not be uh, a great session for you. But uh, I would say to that point that if you love fun and uh, are interested in reminiscing about the days where data was dumb, uh, I encourage you to stick around because uh, we will have a good time. Uh, but if you want to go to other sessions because you know this stuff already, that's totally cool. Um, but I just want to mention that we'll be having a boff tomorrow at 11.45 on, on linked data in Drupal. So if you want to totally geek out on linked data in Drupal and, and all the idiosyncrasies there, uh, come and join us. All right. Well, so I really want to immerse you guys in the experience of being an oceanographer and what it feels like to search for data. And so the data needs of these oceanographers is, is really vast, and it's very difficult to find. And so I want to show you the questions that they ask of our software, just how bad our software is at handling those questions, and then ways that linked data might respond to those and improve uh, that experience for the oceanographer. So uh, is everyone ready? Yeah, OK. <laughs> I got a fist bump, so someone's alive. Here we go. OK. So to do this, to immerse yourself in the experience of an oceanographer, what we really need to do is go all the way back to 1984. Okay, I know uh, Webchick took us back to the 90s yesterday, but we're going to go back even further to the days where hair was super crimped, you had your Varnay sunglasses, the sweater over the shoulders, uh, everything super preppy, you really wanted to drive a Corvette. Uh, and so I want you to imagine yourself as a teenager at this time. You're 16 years old, and you have your license to drive. You see, it's Friday night, and you, you and your friends are going to get together with their friends at their house on the other side of town. But before all this happens, it's up to you, because you have a license to drive, to really make sure that this night goes off really well, right? So you have to get food and entertainment for this night. Okay, so you call the local pizza joint from your town. You're like, hey, I know these guys. They're good. So you say, okay, I'm, I'm going to order my pizza. And, and you tell them to deliver it to this address. And so you're talking to this guy, and you're like, I don't know, man. This, this kid kind of sounds like a dweeb. You know, he says, so uh, what's your address? And you say, well, 1428 Elm Street. And the kid says, okay, well, We'll be there in 30 minutes or less. Or it's free, you know. Because, <laughs> you know, back in the day in 84, that was really the way that they sold pizza delivery to you, is they said, well, if the pizza doesn't get there in 30 minutes, we'll give it to you for free, right? So you just think this kid's a total dweeb, and you're like, whatever. You know, these guys, these guys are good. They're reliable. So you need to go find entertainment, right? So you hop in your car. You put your sunglasses on because the sun's going down, right? And then in the 80s, you only wear your sunglasses at night. So you pop those bad boys on, and you really head out to secure the night's entertainment, right, which is a video rental. And so as you're heading out to the car, your friend comes out the house. He's like, hey, 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 do you know what you're going to rent? And you're like, no. He says, hey, get that one with that, like, righteous dude and that bodacious girl, or, or I mean, the bodacious guy and that righteous girl, and, and get the one with the light beams flying all over the place. You know which one I'm talking about, the one with the force, right? And so meanwhile, you're sitting there, you're scratching your head, you're like, I have no idea. Because you spend all your time thinking about the oceans and science and all that weird stuff. And so not to look like a, a total you know, dweeb to your friends, you're like, okay, man, okay, I'll come back. And so with that rich uh, description of a video cover art, you go off and head to the video store. And so you enter this place, and remember, there's no, like, Google, there's no, like, computer to search, find where these videos are. So you have to, like, walk up and down these aisles and figure out where this video is. And, and you're just feeling terrible, right? Because you're like, what is this Force movie? I'm so dumb, I have no idea what my friends are talking about. And so you're walking up and down these aisles, and it's taking forever. And you're like, oh, my God, the pizza's going to be there in, like, 30 minutes. i got to go. So you just happen to, like, stumble upon, upon this one video, and you're like, yes. I found it. It's Megaforce. <laughs> and you're thinking, 
Yes, I've got the righteous girl. I've got the bodacious dude. Light beams flying everywhere. And it's got force in the title, right? Like, yes, I, I'm going to come through for my buddies this time. We're going to have a good time. But little do you know that this is the beginning of where things are starting to get really unfortunate for you. Because back at the house, they're still hungry and the pizza hasn't shown up. And little do they know that you have no idea what Star Wars is. So they're just like completely bumming. And, and they're just in for a surprise when you get back with this Mega Force video, right? So this pizza situation, you didn't realize that there might have been two Elm Streets in the same spot. And so because you're going to their house in this other town, you completely didn't even think that you should mention that you were going to another town. And so if this was to happen in Austin, Texas, it just so happens that there's two Elm Streets with like 15 minutes distance apart where this could actually happen. And so you don't know this yet because you're on your way back. But the pizza kind of got delivered to the wrong house. And because it took a little bit longer than 30 minutes, that pizza was free. And those people that lived in that Elm Street at 1428 totally didn't mention that they didn't want that free pizza. So they totally gobbled that up. But there's no worries, right? I mean, at least you have Megaforce. So when you get back to the house and they totally realize that you don't have the right movie, that you totally don't know what Star Wars is, even though it's like in the prime, man, like, come on. Uh, your friends are totally dogging you out, right? So like, well, we'll just watch this Megaforce movie and, and, and just have a good time anyway. Except at this house, they have this other thing called a Betamax player. So you're taking this video cassette out and you're like trying to put it in this machine and it totally doesn't fit. Like, no way. So 1984 was the time where there was this other video cassette type that really competed with VHS, and it just was a lot of confusion. It was bad, man. So I can't even tell you. So this Friday night is just completely trashed, and, and, and you go away walking like, like a loser. So what happened here? And what the heck does this have to do with oceanography, right? So in the search for this pizza... What happened was is that you gave an ambiguous query and got no results back, which is often the case for oceanography when they're searching for data, especially when they don't know what they're looking for. And with Megaforce, you know, you, you found something, you got results, but it really wasn't what was expected. And then finally with the Betamax player, you know, even though you had some data, this Megaforce, you couldn't use it because you didn't have the right tools to access it. So let's fast forward to the present. You're this hardened, weathered oceanographer. Your, your experiences in life of asking these questions have completely set you up for this type of career. I mean, just the constant disappointment of not finding what you're looking for is like primo. That's prime oceanography right there. Okay? But you have hope, right? So the funding agencies are starting to fund these sort of like grand challenges of science. Like, wow, tell me what impacts the marine ecosystem uh, from a grand scale, like biology, chemistry, geology, physics, what's going on? And so this gets you really excited. And so you pitch one of these grand ideas and, and you happen to get funding. But you slowly, slowly start to realize, wow, I'm going to need to use computers to, to figure out how to get data to answer these questions. Because you're only an expert in a certain particular area. And to answer these big questions like climate change and marine ecosystem ecologies, you need other experts who collected data, maybe even 10 years ago, to augment and answer these questions. So this right here is the data that you guys, as the oceanographer, desperately need. And you have no idea what it is. You don't even realize that you need it yet. But this zooplankton abundance here is going to help you answer the questions for your funding. And so this zooplankton right here is collected by some kind of net off the coast of Alaska, and that's pretty much all we know because we're not experts on this stuff. So to answer this question, or to, to give researchers access to this data, the national funding agencies back in 2006 realized that all the funding of the data that they had done before for oceanography, they weren't realizing the full potential of all that data because it was just a file and it was really hard to find. And as new research themes emerged, those data could be reused. 
And so in 2006, the National Science Foundation funded a project called Bicodemo. And I know Bicodemo kind of sounds like some weird variation of Pig Latin, but Bicodemo stands for the Biological and Chemical Oceanography Data Management Office. And so what Bicodemo, which is who I work for, what we were set up to do was really help the researchers through the entire data life cycle. So through collection, analysis, uh, to get their data published online so it was accessible and discoverable, so that other researchers could reuse it, uh, and various other things. So remember, you're an oceanographer, you're looking for zooplankton abundance, uh, you have no idea how to help it, or how to find that, and so here's where we step in. So what Bicodemo does is collect all this information surrounding this data file to make it easier for you to do that. And so those things are really the people who collected it, the organizations that they worked for, even the names of their projects. That becomes the cruises and the locations where those cruises were. Uh, that also is the, the, the names of the ships or, or the platforms. We some oceanographers call these things platforms. So platforms could, are typically ships, but they could be submarines or moorings or buoys. Um, so we also collect information about the instruments that are used and deployed off these platforms and the measurements that those things collect. And then, of course, the dollar bills. You always got to know who, who spent the money, right, for this data. So all of this information that we're collecting about data files uh, is, is gathered up and stored in a database. And as of last year, we're, we're running that database and, and, and presenting that information on the, online uh, through Drupal. And so all this information gives what we call context to those data files. And so Bicodemo had these aha moments you know, throughout the years. And this first aha moment was data needs context. So let's take, for instance, this image right here and, and imagine it was a data file. What do you think this data file would be, would be talking about? What, what, what got collected? What got measured here? You know, is it a candlestick or is it two faces facing each other? You know, what was this researcher really looking into? I mean, was he re researching antiques or was it just awkward invasion of personal space? Like, we have no idea. So context, as we understand it, influences the understanding of a subject by surrounding it with information. Okay? And I'm not telling you guys this isn't like this, oh, like, moment. I mean, you guys know this. You guys are Drupal developers. You get it, right? Because when we build websites, we put all this information surrounding the, the main idea of that, that web page or that content, like related links and photos and videos and media and all this stuff. And so one of the main contexts, one of the most important contexts for an oceanographer is uh, the geospatial context. So where was this data collected, right? And let me find it on a map somehow. So Bicodemo really understood this and, and knew that we needed to, to present this to the oceanographers in a way that they'd understand. And so we wanted to build an interface to do this and build it around the cruise, right? So cruises have these really nice tracks that you can follow along the map where data might be collected in these little points all over the place, which makes it really hard to, to digest on a map. So this was our first iteration. You can see that you, know, you can use this map down here at the bottom and, and zoom in and, and look at these cruise tracks and, and click on them and get more data. But if you don't want to use the, the map, You've got these facets up at the top, and they're using words like program and project and deployment. And that might mean something to an oceanographer, like which project got funded or which deployment or cruise was, was used to collect this data. But if you're looking for your zooplankton abundance now, how do you find that here? And so naturally, like all other you know, folks that put up a, a search interface, you throw up like a keyword search, your free text search. And so you're, you're the oceanographer, you come to this site and you type in, well, I want to search for plankton off the coast of Alaska. And this is the results that you get. And it doesn't look that much different from what was before. Because the machines just do a horrible job of processing these, these free text things and, until we give it uh, some type of idea of, of what those words mean. So you're this researcher and you still haven't found what you're looking for. I mean, come on, this zooplankton abundance is out there somewhere. Come on, help me find it. So the next aha moment that Bicodemo had was that we need data to be, to be cooperative, right? So to address these grand challenges where data might be all over the place, we need interoperable systems to aid in the exchange and discovery of this data. 
And so there are a couple places out there where, where there's data, and, and we can access those through web services and APIs, and, and that's great. You know, APIs are great. But the problem here is that the machines can't consume the data, even though the humans can. So even if these places have APIs, APIs only work because us programmers and us developers can look at the documentation and consume it and then write programs around it. And so we realized that these data centers were going to be popping up all over the place, and it just didn't scale to, to implement custom APIs for each individual one. And furthermore, sometimes the, the, the web services themselves with these APIs can be kind of vague as to what they're going to deliver you. And so just to give you a couple examples, right? So we, most of you guys have seen LinkedIn and Facebook, and they use words like connected and friends to describe relationships between things. And so you're, you as an oceanographer, right, you've got a LinkedIn account, and you're connected to another oceanographer, but you're also connected to your next-door neighbor because last week they sent you an email that says, connect with me, and you felt guilty, and there's all this backstory why you said yes, and so now you're connected to these two different people in two different ways, but you're still connected, right? So it, what does our site do with that data? Can we infer that your next-door neighbor worked on your oceanographic research with this other connected person? Or with Facebook, like, you're friends with your coworkers and you're friends with your family, but you're also friends with your high school acquaintances? Like, maybe there's something here that's missing in the way that we describe our data. So let me give you an example, right? So here's a picture of the moon, and in the middle of this picture is a red dot where Apollo 11 landed. And so Apollo 11 is the, the mission that sent Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin to the moon. And Neil Armstrong stepped out, and he took his first steps right there at that red dot. And just to the left of that is this crater called Copernicus. And so there's software and websites out there that try to mash up data. And, and one of those uh, takes, looks out on the web and, and looks for lat long coordinates. And it's really cool. You can map Copernicus, the, this lunar crater. So as I did this, I was looking at it, and I was like, wow, that map just looks kind of weird, right? So as you zoom out, you realize that Copernicus got plotted in Chad, Africa, which means that Neil Armstrong walked on the moon for the first time in southern Sudan, which is crazy. Like, did he get hit by an antelope or something? I don't know. But the point here is, is that either the data didn't have the right context to say, okay, this lat long is really about the moon and not the earth, or maybe the software just didn't have the, the wherewithal to think that. Or maybe this is what the software intended to show what the, the relationship between earth coordinates and, and lunar coordinates. We have no idea. But, okay, that's a geeky example. Sorry, it, you know, we work for science. You know, let's give one that's just a little bit more digestible. So let's say there's this site out there for grass-fed beef supplies, right? You can buy grass-fed beef products right off this website, right? So the site owner's got this site up here for a while, and he's not really making that money off this. He's, you know, he's, it's not really generating an income for him, and he's getting kind of worried that he might have to go down to, to McDonald's to eat, and that's really freaking him out. So he says to his site engineers, like, hey, man, can you guys, like, build some type of system where we can generate some revenue off this site? Like, maybe you can connect it up to products based on, like, what users search for in the search box, right? So we'll deliver them content, but we'll also deliver them, like, related products that, that they can buy. So your engineers are like, yeah, I love a challenge. They're getting geeked up just about the challenge, right? So they go off and implement this thing. And Healthy Joe comes to the website because he's heard some story that, like, coastal beef is way tastier than Midland beef. Uh, no offense, Texas. I don't hope there's no... No, no offense to your beef, yeah, it's great. Um, but anyway, Healthy Joe's like, yo, is this really true? Like, is coastal beef really tastier than Midland beef? So he comes to this website, types in coastal beef. That algorithm goes off and finds this article about coastal beef. But it also goes off to the internet and it's like, okay, what products can I find about coastal beef? What can I find? And so if you Google coastal beef, the first two hits are about <laughs> hip hop and the death of Tupac and Biggie. So now that algorithm has gone off and found, okay, Biggie had this album called Ready to Die. Great, it's a product. Let's sell it. So this coastal beef site is now selling you a product that says, are you ready to die? So maybe this isn't the message that we want to send on this website, right? And so Healthy Joe completely freaks out. 
He doesn't know what's going on and what this whole, whole coastal beef thing is. So he totally leaves. He doesn't even buy any beef. So now you're really out of pocket. So what we're realizing here is that for reliable data exchange to happen between systems, we really need semantic interoperability. And so semantic interoperability sounds like some phrase that some undergrad just throws into a paper to sound smart, right? But semantic interoperability in this case means that the sender knows that ready to die is a musical work and that the receiver of that data should interpret it as a musical work. And so you can define semantic interoperability as this means of shared understanding that can happen between two systems throughout content exchange. And so I want to make this point to all my web developers, content producers, that if your content is worthy of a website, then it deserves to be understood by not only the humans, which we do a really good job at, but also by the mediators and the machines. So I think that linked data really solves this problem well, and I'll show you how it solved it for, for Bico Demo in terms of this geospatial mapping interface. And so I'll, I'll throw up a little screencast, and I'll talk you through that, and then we'll just sort of dissect what's, what's really going on here so we can understand what this linked data thing is all about. So let me move this over here. And Am I any close to making this full screen here? <laughs> So, I'm going to have to, like, hunch over this desk. This is crazy. Okay, so what's going on here? This is the next iteration of the geospatial mapping interface with linked data. Okay, so you're this oceanographer, right? And you're, you're coming to this, and you, all you know is that you want plankton data. Um, you want it in the Northeast Pacific. And so you know that there was a ship or a platform called RV Wacoma that does work in the Northeast Pacific. So you go off and you find that, and it adds that little RV Wacoma to your, to your search uh, criteria. And you know that you're looking for, what are we on? Parameters, instruments. Help me out here, people. I can't see. Is this, you can mirror the screen if you want. Is it biota? OK. So you know that you want abundance data, so you add that to your search. And so this is just sort of compounding the facets and, and just drilling right down as you add more facets to this thing here. And so you add your, your instruments. You're looking through these, these uh, sort of like categories, looking for like specific instruments or, or just even a category that relates to this instrument. Like, I don't even know what plankton nets are called, but I know I want a plankton net, so, so let me grab that. And so finally, you know that out of these, this list of people that did work in the Northeast Pacific that you recognize Ken Cole's name. So you're like, ah, oh, Ken Coyle. I know he does good work. Uh, it looks like he did some, some plankton network, so, so let me click on him. And so this just like really drills down into what, what he did. And, and you can click on what looks like a data set here, even though it has a completely illegible name. And you can go off and, and look at the metadata in our Drupal site and say, OK, there's Ken Coyle. He was the co-PI. So if you went through traditional search mechanisms, you might not even find that Ken Coyle was associated to this data. So you go back to the interface. You're like, yep, this looks good. Let me just plot it and just see what kind of data there is. And now with abundance data, there's different ways to classify the organisms. And you can do that by stage. And so these stages are classified like Show me how many adult males or adult females. So you, you, you find some species that you know, and you say, you know, map the abundance data, and then show me all, like, the adult males, right? So you're waiting, waiting, and up pop these little dots, and you can click on them and, and see the exact results, the abundance values, and great, like, this is exactly what I want. I didn't have to, like, look through a million cruises on this wonky interface and I can download the data right there. Okay, so let's cut this video out here. All right, so what's the application stack here? So this is map server, some open source software, 
sitting on top of open search, which is just a, like an open standard to describe search engines. That's sitting on top of linked data, and Drupal is supplying this linked data. And so at this point, if I was you, I'd be thinking like, oh, what's the big deal? That's just faceted search. There's nothing amazing about what we just saw, right? But what linked data was doing there was it was giving some facets for data from third parties. So this is data that Picodemo didn't collect, didn't curate, didn't do anything with, but found uh, through linked data. And those, those two facets were the instruments by type and the parameters by type. And so those two facets came from this community called CDataNet over in Europe. And so this is like a conglomerate of 44 different data centers and organizations across Europe that got together and formed this repository of oceanographic terms. And, and they're really considered like the de facto authoritative source to describe instruments and parameters. And so one of their partners, British Oceanographic Data Center, BODC, decided to expose it as linked data. And we think that it was just assumed that, you know, maybe there's other partners in these 44 that would want to use this in this common, sort of common format. But they had no idea that one of their consumers would be across the pond 3,000 miles away uh, in Bico Demo. So what does linked data do for us? In addressing the sort of three ahas that Bico Demo had, linked data provides context through RDF vocabularies, it provides cooperation through common frameworks, which means that my data and their data can talk and exchange ideas over a, over a common sort of like format and framework. There's this idea of cooperation without coordination, which means that I didn't need to call up BODC and say, hey, I want to use your data. I didn't have to call CDataNet. I didn't have to register for you know, an application key or an OAuth secret key or whatever all that other stuff is for APIs. I could just use their data without having to do anything but just call on it. And finally, semantic interoperability, interoperability through HTTP URIs for naming things. So I've just described all these, these funky things like what the heck is the HTTP URIs for naming things mean? What is, what is cooperation and RDF vocabularies? Like it just kind of feels like we just drove off the cliff, right? But I don't want to explain too much because the good news is that on Drupal, these tools make it so easy to, to implement these things that it abstracts out all this sort of like funky junk like RDF vocabularies and semantic interoperability through URIs. And so linked data and, and, and Drupal really play nicely. So on this URI thing, Drupal content already has globally unique URIs, right? You've got node slash NID and taxonomy term slash TID and, and user slash UID, right? Drupal also has mechanisms for serializing that content in many different formats. So you've got your REST WS, which you can take your node and, yeah, it serializes it into HTML without REST WS, but you can also serialize it as JSON and, and XML. And finally, the Drupal community has got these really awesome uh, folks like SCORE who, who contributes modules that do amazing work. And so with these three, you can really publish quality linked data. So I want to introduce SCORE and bring him up to uh, talk about RDF. Thank you, Adam. So I want to tell you a bit more about the modules that Adam used to build uh, BicoDemo. So it starts with uh, the core, Drupal 7 core as a basis. Um, it has, like Adam said, entities all have uh, globally unique URIs out of the box. And then what we do for generating RDFs, uh, RDF out of your data that lives in Drupal is that we map your content types to RDF classes, and then we map your fields to uh, RDF properties. And then we generate RDF data from there. And what, what happens wh by doing so is we give more context to your data. So instead of being ambiguous data, it becomes much more contextualized and it can be reusable and understood by other peers. Um, another module that Adam is using is RDFX in Contrib. So the main point of this module is that it provides a, plat a platform or a solution to serialize RDF in other formats. So Drupal core alone only supports one format, which is RDFA in HTML. This RDFX module allows you to serialize RDF in other formats like JSON, 
uh, with JSON-LD, XML, and text. And that's also combined with the RDFS, uh, REST WS, sorry, module. And so we have a picture of um, several bags of chips here, and it's just to illustrate the fact that serializations are just different uh, flavors of your same uh, data. So um, at the end of the day, no matter what format you're using to serialize your data, the meaning remains the same, the data model remains the same. We also have an RDF UI module. So this module is useful to create the mappings that I was telling you about uh, the RDF classes and the RDF properties. So you can ref reference um, any, pretty much any kind of RDF vocabulary from out there. You import namespace and then um, you can choose the mappings for all your content types and all of your fields. So I, I just want to reference a, a video or a talk that Tim Berners-Lee did uh, a few years back where he was showing uh, a bag of potato chips. And his point was that if you look at uh, a bag of potato chips, the front usually is for us humans. It's got you know a delicious picture of um, chips. Uh, Want to make it make it make it appealing for us to eat. And then in the back, you have different different bunch of uh, data, basically targeting targeting different kind of consumers. Uh, there's the the rectangle of nutrition facts. Uh, and then there's the barcode which is used by the store and then there might be uh, a list of ingredients for again for us humans and um, then you might also find a kind of an obscure number somewhere at the bottom and it doesn't really make sense to you but it, w it makes sense to the manufacturer and it, it was probably printed on the bag by the at the factory so this is to illustrate the fact that even if you have uh, different kinds of data, and you might not understand all of those data, but they, may, they might make sense for other, uh, other people and other um, organizations. So RDF supports that. It's, it's fine. Um, you, can, you don't have to understand all of the data that you find in your, in your RDF. And that's why we have different vocabularies um, affecting different kinds of data and describing different kinds of data. So I'm going to... So one of the things that happens when you turn on RDF or RDFX is that you get these already out of the box default RDF vocabularies for all of your content fields, or excuse me, for, for the most common content fields. And you can add others and there's, and there's clues into that. But I wanted to show up or put up on the screen what Bicodemo was using for vocabularies just to, to give you a hand. Or maybe this is a good direction on, on where to start. So first off, there was we, we created our own vocabulary called the Ocean Data Ontology just to describe all the intricate relationships between cruises and people and the projects and the funding and all that stuff. But really we ended up using a lot of vocabularies that already existed for things like just generic metadata. We use Dublin Core. So this is like the created date of your nodes or the updated date of your nodes or the title of your node. And we use DCAT, which is a, a data set catalog vocabulary, so that helps us describe you know, what the data sets are, are like, where you can download those files. We use FOF, which stands for friend of a friend. And even though I made fun of friends, uh, this is a pretty good vocabulary. Um, so we use FOF to describe people and organizations. We also use another vocabulary called VOID, or vocabulary of interlinking data sets. Uh, wicked nerdy, I don't know how they came up with that, that title. But void describes how you, your content links to others' content. So this would describe how Bicodemo links to the C data net vocabulary and gives machines a way to figure out you know, how you talk about those relationships. Another vocabulary that we use is GeoSparkle, and this talks about geometric features. So when we talk about cruise tracks and, and where the, this instrument was towed, the path that it followed, uh, GeoSparkle describes that content. And then finally, Prov O, which is really about like revisions and activities. So this is, this user updated this node, or you know, this person deleted that, or, or this one generated another node based on this other node. 
And finally, I just wanted to put up a link here in case you're interested in this, that you can create your own RDF vocabularies, and this is a good place to start. So if you're going to power up your sites, right, the first thing you want to do is enable RDF and RDFX. And you don't have to do anything with those things but just enable them to gain immediate semantic interoperability on your site. So the next sort of power-up that you can do on your site is really about how do you make this data queryable. And so in that open, uh, excuse me, in that, that stack of technology that we showed earlier, what's sitting in between open search and this linked data is this Sparkle language that, that lets open search figure out how to talk to linked data. And so I want to bring up Score to talk about his next module. So this is another module, and it's kind of the corner piece of, uh, of Bicodemo. So we've seen how we can publish uh, the data as RDF in different formats, but what about querying this data? If you don't know what you're looking for, you want an interface to query. So I wrote this module, RDF Indexer, and its role is to simply index your data in a triple store, and it uses the search API to keep track of all the entities that need to be indexed. Um, and uh, on this diagram, you can see how it works. You have your triple site on the left, uh, regular stack for a triple site. And the same way you, you could have a solar instance uh, on the top, on the right, the same, the RDF indexer module works the same way. There's uh, an RDF store that serves as, a, as an index on the bottom right corner and the site will send data, will ship data. Every time there's an update to an entity, it will ship that new version of the entity to that index, to this RDF store. And this RDF store could be any backend. On this diagram, it's an ARC2 backend. Uh, Adam will talk about another backend uh, in a moment, but that doesn't matter, it's, it's extensible. Um, it uses search API, like I said. So when you register your server, or your, your index, um, you can specify um, how to access it. Um, by default, it's ARC2, so this is a local store. If it's a remote store, like it would be most of the time, uh, you might have to fit in the IP address and, and whatever other HTTP credentials to be allowed to index data and send data. And uh, depending, again, on your backend, you will most likely have a Sparkle endpoint. This is just the ARC2. Sparkle endpoint that you get out of the box, but each backend has its own interface for the Sparkle endpoint. Thank you. Okay, great. So when Score released this RDF indexer module, my eyes like immediately lit up, right? So Bicodemo was doing all this work before we got to Drupal, and so one of the ways that we had to, you know, make our data queryable was we had to write these PHP scripts that talk to this MySQL database and create the RDF, and then that had to wait for a batch process to take all those RDF and dump it into this store so that it could be queryable. And it was just, what a pain in the neck. And so when this module came along, it was like the lights went off, like, oh man, we can leverage this to, to import this RDF data that RDFX is already generating for us on the fly, so we don't have to do that. We can throw away those old PHP scripts. And then we can have the search API just automatically update this index. And so because we were using this external store called Virtuoso, um, we were just able to really quickly write this patch to um, index and update and delete out of this Virtuoso. So I've thrown up the, the, where you can find the patch at the drupal.org link. And uh, here's the Bicodemo Sparkle endpoint if you want to play and just look at the data that's in there. So power-up number two is to enable RDF indexer to make your data queryable and, and just use the defaults like Stefan said. You, you've got the ARC2 store there, and that'll create a Sparkle endpoint for your data on your Drupal site. And so we've been talking about how Bicodemo linked to CDataNet terms, and I just want to show you real quickly uh, how, how that looks. So here's just like a quick snapshot of one of our parameter pages. This is the abundance parameter at Bicodemo. And so we've, you can see a little link there that says external identifier and it's this link and you can click it. And that's really the only connection between what we think abundance is and what CDataNet talks about for abundance. It's really just a content type field that we populate with a link. And so if you click that link for CDataNet, you get this 
RDF serialization, and they just happen to serialize in, in XML. And you can see that this is that biota abundance, biodiversity folder that we clicked, which was somewhere along the hierarchy of all their terms. And so you can see that there's all these narrowings of what that means, and so these are more specific parameters. So somehow, our abundance parameter is linked and can relate to all these other more specific parameters about biodiversity and biota and abundance and what that means, just through a link, through a field in, in Drupal. And so just to show you what our RDF looks like in the same format, you can see that this link to CDataNet is in this RDF file, and this is what makes semantic interoperability between Bicodemo and, and the CDataNet terms. And so the last power-up I just want to talk about is that you can generate value for your own content by linking to other data sets. And there's a ton out there. Here's three examples, Freebase, Wikidata, and, and DBpedia. And so one of the advantages that we've been finding at Bicodemo is that by linking to these C data net terms, when BODC starts to add multilingual support, right, like here's the Spanish version of this term, here's the, you know, whatever, French version of this term, that is providing multilingual support at our site for free because we can now accept the French term and query it against the, the C data net data set and figure out what it means in English and return that back to the user. So there's a ton of linked data out there, a ton of Sparkle endpoints. So whatever your use case it is, whatever, whatever you're trying to do on the web, whether that's expand knowledge or generate revenue, uh, there's a ton of data out there and you can leverage that. So I wanna just share just a quick, in closing, just a quick excerpt out of this innovation report that was published about a month ago by uh, the New York Times. And they're talking about linked data and structured data and, and they're just sort of remorse about not doing it sooner. So they say there's substantial cost to waiting. And, and they cite an example about their recipe database. They say, you know, we floundered for 15 years to build this useful recipe database, and it didn't work for all that time because it wasn't properly tagged by ingredients and cooking time. And it's just so weird to, to hear that. Like, you'd think, well, why wouldn't you? And so I guess the point here is that we have no idea what the next new facet for searching data is going to be for recipes. Like, maybe it's oh my gosh, show me all the recipes in this part of the region. We don't know, but if you have that semantic information about these recipes and you tag it in RDF, it enables us much later down the road to respond to these situations when they arise. And so this report goes on to say, we can't do it now, but only after spending, a, or we can do it now, but only after spending a huge sum to retroactively structure this data. And they sum this, this section of the report up by saying, our lack of structured data helps ex explain why we're unable to automate sales of photos on the New York Times website and why we continually struggle to attain higher rankings on the search engines. And they finalize it by saying, we need to reclaim our industry leading position, but right now our needs are far more basic. We must expand our structured data we create. So I wanna close this talk by giving you a quote from Mark Twain who said, I like a good story, well told. And I know you guys have great content and I hope you tell it well with structured data because it's all about the context and the content. Thank you very much. So I just wanna throw up here a couple references that really helped me out. Uh, this linked data book, by uh, David Wood, published by Manning, is a fascinating resource that talks about other use cases uh, for linked data, specifically the BBC, uh, who, with a small development team, really leveraged linked data to push out content that they didn't own at all by really using Wikipedia data. Um, so Learning Sparkle is a really great resource for just trying to figure out how to query this data. Uh, it's very similar to, to SQL. Uh, and it's really easy to jump into. This book is great. And then finally, uh, the definitive guide to Drupal 7, uh, chapter 28, which Stefan contributed. Uh, and lastly, I just want to mention there's a boff on linked data. So if this topic interests you or there was something that you have questions about that we can't address at the end of this talk, uh, we encourage you to come out to this boff and, and totally geek out with us and, and, and bang us up on questions. So 
we, we open you up to ask questions, and you can always hit us up later on, on Twitter or Drupal.org. Uh, so, yeah, have at it. So, hi, thanks. Um, so, could you talk a little bit about the manual process involved in adding a data set and, and getting that into RDF format? Sure. So the actual data files that BicoDemo gets, you know, they might just get emailed by the, the ocean, oceanographer uh, to us, and so that just gets thrown on a, on a server somewhere. And so the, what NSF is funding at BicoDemo is really the man hours for these data managers to say, to go out and collect all this metadata like, okay, who are the PIs involved? What was the project? Who funded them? And so this is something that typically, before BicoDemo existed, that would be a responsibility of the oceanographer, the PI. But they just don't have time for that. They just want to do their research. They don't care. They don't care if someone else can find their data. But they care when they can't find other people's data. So that's why BicoDemo got funded. And that's why we really feel like this effort is important. Okay. Uh can you talk about Solar? Sure. I'll, I'm going to turn that over to Score because I have no idea. <laughs> um, so, yeah, we, we talked about, I mentioned Solar earlier, and it was really as a, as a comparison. Uh, so, BicoDemo is not using Solar as far as I know. No. So, it, it was just to say that usually the way Solar works is the same way the RDF indexer module works. Drupal will send data to a solar server to be indexed. Um, solar is um, a search engine that is very fast and a very, for full text search. So it has also facets, so you can have a very nice and very fast, efficient search experience. So you, Drupal sends the data, the entities to solar, and then when the time comes to, uh, to answer a search query, it will query the solar index for results. Um, we use the same approach in RDF indexer. Uh, we send our entities translated to RDF to the triple store. And then the search part um, doesn't necessarily happen f between Drupal and, and the RDF store. Typically, there's a Sparkle interface, and it's, you know, oftentimes it's going to be a different workflow. So there's going to be, in the case of BicoDemo, it's a different interface. So the the user interface that Adam demonstrated earlier where there was a map and different facets, that's not Drupal, that's built separately and it requests the data from the Sparkle endpoint as RDF data and then it visualizes it on, on the, inside the user interface. But so I just mentioned Solar, it's a, it's a comparison just to say we use the same idea as Solar where we send the data for indexing. Does that make sense? Nobody else has. Uh, are you storing this external in the data? Mic. In the mic, please. Uh, are you storing external data? So you're gathering this from external sources. Do you store it in Drupal or no? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so there's a lot of usability issues. So, you know, with these Sparkle queries, and especially if you're linking off to external data sets, you know, what's the availability of that Sparkle endpoint? Like, what if it goes down and you're, you have an oceanographer in the middle of a, of a query on that, in that interface? So... What we do is that we, we harvest all that external data that we need, that we link to at CDataNet, and we store it inside our Virtuoso triple store. So we don't store it in Drupal, we just keep it uh, in a separate location on the triple store so that we can query it at will, and then just keep it up to date uh, behind the scenes. Thank you. Sure. How often do you update that? Daily? Uh, yeah, we do it nightly. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that was, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was just going to say that uh, since we've uh, used this data from CDataNet, we've established relationships with uh, folks at BODC. And to be honest with you, I'm sure we knew them before uh, we started this collaboration, and, and they probably made mention of this data to us. I wasn't at the office when that happened. Um, but we've talked to them, and we've realized that, you know, they don't update that a ton of the time. Uh, so we felt like daily was fine. Uh, did you ever watch Megaforce? I've never watched Megaforce, but that slogan, Deeds Not Words, totally makes me want to watch it. Like, can we please get Megaforce shown at dr the Alamo Draft House tonight? Come on, man. Hi, I'm, I'm new to uh, linked data. The question I have is I've used uh, the schema.org module 
And I would like to understand the differences between that and uh, RDF, the use cases for it. Okay, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so I would qualify schema.org as more of a lightweight solution compared to this. Um, and schema.org, you remember I mentioned uh, something about the vocabularies earlier, how we pick a vocabulary depending on what we're describing. And Adam showed the list of vocabularies that they're using. So schema.org is just another vocabulary. And it's in fact maybe the, m the main vocabulary that people should be aware of and possibly use first and see if that covers their needs. Um, schema.org was designed um, and sponsored by the, all the, the main search engines like Google and Yahoo and Bing to uh, cover the majority of the use cases uh, of regular sites like e-commerce and recipes and events and, and hundreds of other types. Um, but it doesn't necessarily cover all the niche, the more niche topics like oceanography research. So that's why you need to add on top of schema.org um, more specialized vocabularies like become Demo did. But if you're just starting out, schema.org is, is a fine vocabulary to start with. And this is, this is in, there is in fact a module called schema.org that kind of uh, makes the mapping process a bit easier. It abstracts away the, the aspect of multiple vocabularies. The UI just talks about schema.org only because it, oftentimes that, that's all you need. So it's um, the API, you know, you can start with schema.org and then later on switch, turn on the full-blown RDFX to, uh, to integrate more vocabularies if you need them. Does RDF allow you to create your own vocabularies then? Uh, like oh. a domain-specific language? Right. RDF in general, um, and that's not specific to Drupal, but RDF was designed, yes, to, to let you design other vocabularies and mix, mix and match vocabularies the same way you mix and match data. So, yes. Yeah, yeah. I just want to say something about that question specifically. Uh, and, and this really illustrates the beauty of linked data is that uh, linked data is really built from the bottom up. You can build your own RDF vocabularies and talk about the relationships between your concepts, the way that you understand them, and the way that your site thinks about them. You don't have to let someone else dictate to you what those things are. And so you, you might think that's like a, a bad thing, like, oh, geez, well, how do we then interoperate if we all think differently about these things? Well, RDF provides a mechanism for you to link to those other vocabularies when they emerge uh, and, and describe how your concept relates to that concept. So for instance, like the potato bag of chips, right? Um, the nutrition facts, you might come out with your own nutrition RDF vocabulary in the way that you think nutrition's important. And then the FDA comes out a couple years later and releases its de facto nutrition RDF vocabulary. Linked data and RDF gives you a way to, to talk about how you talk about calories and the way that that relates to, to the way that the FDA talks about calories if that helps. Uh, you had a list of RDF vocabularies. I was wondering, do you manage some of them on, within Drupal, or is that from a se separate database? Yeah, great question. Uh, so I don't use Drupal to manage those. Um, the tool that we use is a, a tool called Protege, which helps you build these vocabularies and, and serializes what's called an, a web ontology language file, mm -hmm. uh, an OWL file. Um, but I would be happy to use Drupal to, to do that because it's got all the revision tracking built right in. So That's yeah. really hard to build. Yeah. <laughs> <try it>. Yes. <laughs> um, maybe a weird question to ask, but um, how did you integrate Protege into Drupal and how did the oh, okay. like interface so, to manage that or to reference those vocabularies? Is that also tagged in Drupal or is it separately? No, sorry. I'm, maybe I misspoke. So we use Protege to, to help us build these RDF vocabularies and you know, the outcome of that is an OWL file, and then we serve that from a website somewhere, which might be Drupal, might not be. Um, we just need to make sure that it's on the web accessible so that if someone dereferences that URI to that OWL file, that they in fact get some type of RDF that talks about that vocabulary. And then, and then I think you copy paste basically from, from the OWL file URL, URI uh, into the RDF UI, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, classes and properties, basically. Yeah, so, oh, okay, so in Drupal, when we, so in our Demo site, 
when we say, okay, well, this thing, this cruise has the ocean data ontology class cruise, uh, we could do that through RDF UI, that, that sort of like user interface that gives you the way to talk about those things. Um, but you can also do it in code. There's uh, some hooks that you can use, which I'd be happy to show you um, afterward if you want to just ping on this. And while we talk about code, I forgot to mention that um, I guess all the modules that we showed today, and especially, especially RDF indexer and also the mappings, all of those configuration settings can be exported as features. So um, you can deploy that very easily. You can manage the versioning. Uh, if you make changes to your data model, all of that goes through code. And so it's, it can be tracked very easily. So you can use the UI on your local host to kind of set the mappings up. And then you export that into code, and that lives in the code, and then it gets deployed. Thank you. So uh, we hope that you enjoyed this session. Please go off to the website and, uh, and evaluate us. Uh, tell us how horrible we did or how good we did or something that you thought was funny like Megaforce or something. Um, so thank you so much for coming. And uh, please just want to remind you that we do have a BOF, which is tomorrow. Um, Lunchtime tomorrow. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so come check us out. I think we had a slide, but I don't know where. Oh, there we go. So come and talk to us more. It was great to have you.